Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Those of you at the Southside Library um, and those of you joining us here virtually online, I appreciate you all being here for this really awesome program celebrating New Mexico's chilies. Um, my favorite smell, seasonal smell, is chili roasting. Um, so this program is with New Mexico State University's Stephanie Walker. Um, we'll start with some introductions, uh, then a presentation. And lastly, we will have time to take questions and comments. If you have any technical difficulties, feel free to type in your concern in the chat box and I'll assist you there to ask a question or make a comment. Please feel free to raise your hand to be unmuted or type it in the chat box or Q&A box and we will address them at the appropriate time. Erin over at the Southside Library will make sure our in-person audience um, over there will have the opportunity to ask questions and make comments as well. Fall in New Mexico is chili pepper harvest time. New Mexico State University's Stephanie Walker will present an informational program that will discuss New Mexico's connection with chili peppers, as well as tips on harvesting, harvesting, preserving, and using them. Professor Walker is um, co-director of the Chili Pepper Institute and is the vegetable specialist for New Mexico State University Extension Services. Please welcome Stephanie Walker and celebrating New Mexico's chilies. You know, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so yes, this is definitely one of my favorite topics as well. So when I was invited to give this a talk, I was uh, very, very pleased to be able to assist. Okay, let's hope I can forward my slides now. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so before we get into uh, chili peppers in New Mexico and our rich history with this crop, let's give a little bit of a background and discuss where chili peppers actually originally came from. Uh, so most of us know that uh, chili peppers are in the nightshade family, the solanaceous family that also includes uh, the much beloved tomatoes, eggplants, and potatoes. Uh, chili peppers are in the genus capsicum and within capsicum, there's five domestic species, C. anum, brutescens, chinensi, baccatum, and pubescens. Now, if you love Tabasco sauce, you're eating brutescens peppers. If you love habaneros, you're eating chinensi. However, most of the chili peppers that we eat here in the United States, certainly here in New Mexico, and through most of the world, uh, C. anum is the uh, most popular species grown. And this does include our New Mexico types, both the green and red, as well as the uh, very popular bell peppers, uh, cayenne, jalapenos, and many other types. So chili peppers uh, orig originated, their center of origin is actually in South America, near the uh, borders of Brazil, Bolivia, and Paraguay. And uh, this is where we still find the greatest concentration of wild species. And this is a very rich source of a uh, wild genetics uh, that can give us uh, traits for disease resistance and other important, uh, um, important traits that we may want to put into some of our domesticated varieties. Now, for the most part, wild chili peppers have very, very small fruit that are erect. They stick right up on the plant and uh, they're very easily detached from the plant when they're ripe and red and birds just love them. So birds see these beautiful little red fruit. Uh, birds do not taste the pungency. They don't have the receptors in their mouths to uh, actually sense the heat. So they pick up those red fruit, they eat them. The fruit go through their digestive tract, they fly off, and then they deposit the seed uh, some distance from where it, it started, along with a nice uh, fertilizer deposit. So originally, birds were the perfect, uh, perfect host there to help spread chili peppers far, far and wide. So these bird peppers are chiltepines. They are in the anum species. They're often called chili piquin. And uh, all the other chili pepper varieties we see, including the New Mexico type, including bell peppers, they all had their origins in these very, very small peppers that through human selection, we've developed the different pod shapes that we see now. So chiltepines are very, very high in heat, about 50,000 to 100,000 100, Scoville heat units. 
And if you try to grow your own chiltopene seed, you can find that you have difficulty getting the seeds to germinate. And that's because in nature, when those seeds go through the bird gut, it's a perfect way to scar scarify those seeds and really get them primed for germination. Uh, you can still find wild chiltopene plants even here in the United States in uh, southern Arizona and southern Texas, where, uh, where it's some of the warmest parts of the country. Stephanie, um, yeah. you aren't sharing your screen yet. Uh, oh, I'm really, you're not seeing, oh. No, so I don't see okay. your presentation. Oh, hmm, I think it must have come out then. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Oh, good, good. Okay, gosh, I lost it. So let's see. Oops. I'll quickly show you the pictures that you missed. My apologies to the audience. Diversity of a capsicum. <laughs> Here's where the greatest concentration of wild uh, chiltopene, wild chili peppers are. Here are some uh, chiltopene peppers. Here's a wild, okay, so here, thank you very much for letting me know that. My, my apologies. So uh, capsicum, chili peppers have been uh, eaten by humans for at least 7,000, uh, at least since 7,000 BC. So we know that chili fruit were first gathered from wild plants. And of course, the humans quickly noticed that, uh, that pungency uh, and they, they quickly realized they could use chili peppers for medicinal purposes. So the Mayans used it to treat asthma, coughs and sore throats. Uh, Aztecs used to relieve toothaches. And of course, even now we still use uh, chili peppers and the capsicum chemical that imparts the heat in uh, compounds like uh, uh, arthritis rub and other, uh, other medicines. So in addition to harvesting chili peppers in the wild, uh, this is also one of the very first crops in the Americas that humans started the domestication process. And this was by selecting seed from wild plants that had the traits, the heat, uh, the flavor uh, that they preferred, and they started planting their own chili peppers. We know that uh, humans started domesticating chili peppers at least five times, five different times in different parts of South and Middle America. Of course, uh, these Native Americans, when they were selecting seed and starting this breeding process on chili peppers, they preferred plants that had larger fruit, of course, more bang for the buck. Uh, with the larger fruit, we needed a stronger attachment force where the fruit would stay on the plant and not fall off once it turned red. And of course, with that came the pendant fruit shape or the fruits uh, pointing down as opposed to being erect on the plants where birds would always harvest them. So for this reason, of course, uh, birds could no longer spread the seed of these very large fruits. So then it became up to humans uh, to spread chili pepper seed. And we have uh, done a splendid job of doing that. In fact, uh, so chili peppers are truly a new world crop. And I know uh, Christopher Columbus's reputation has really taken a beating in recent years, but this is one thing that he did, is he uh, did discover chili peppers and introduce the seed to the old world. And actually discovery day for chili peppers was New Year's Day in 1493. Uh, of course, Christopher Columbus was looking for black pepper, and he certainly was into marketing himself. So when he discovered this very pungent red pepper, he called it red pepper, and of course, quickly told everyone far and wide that this, this spice is more abundant and more valuable than black pepper, which of course, in my biased viewpoint, I, I have to agree with him there. <laughs> I like black pepper too, but, but red pepper is uh, definitely preferred by me and, and many. So uh, once Christopher Columbus gathered the red pepper seed, it quickly moved throughout Europe and Asia through the period of about 1493 to 1542. And uh, of course, um, this is why the whole reason why Christopher Columbus and other explorers uh, went on these voyages, it was to look for spices and uh, other plants to uh, help with the diet back in Europe. Uh, once the chili seed hit Europe, uh, it quickly spread throughout the world through different traders, different trade routes. Uh, today, even though we know New Mexico is a huge producer of chili peppers, the United States overall is only fifth in production. So we're followed by China, Mexico, Turkey, and Indonesia in actual produ production volume. Uh, but I will say chili peppers are big throughout the world. Uh, we know that uh, today, 
chili pepper trade is worth more than either coffee or tea. And I think we, we all love our coffee and tea as well, but chili peppers are bigger. So let's talk about New Mexico then. How did New Mexico become the center uh, of chili peppers here in the United States? Well, first I will say that although New Mexico doesn't have the uh, agricultural acreage of other states, for chili peppers, we are the, the largest producer of chili peppers in the US, and that's discounting bell peppers, even though bell peppers are the same genus and species. Uh, we don't include them when we talk about the pungent or slightly pungent chili peppers. And chili certainly is intertwined with the culture and historical heritage of the state. We were uh, very early in, in proclaiming it the state vegetable. So chili is now our official state vegetable. Uh, red or green is the official New Mexico state question. And just this year in 2023, uh, the, the aroma of roasting green chilies was declared the official state aroma of New Mexico. So, so obviously a lot of people here in this state have chili peppers on their mind and quite a passion for the crop. And, and indeed, chili peppers uh, have, have deep historic roots here in this part of the world. It's been cultivated here in what is now New Mexico for more than 400 years. So although there's still a lot of debate about whether it was Native Americans or the Spanish that introduced seed into the New Mexico area, we do have the Spanish written records. So because they wrote this down, they, they tend to get credit for this uh, introduction. Uh, according to their written records, uh, the chili peppers were introduced into this part of the world by Juan, Juan de Oñate. Uh, the introduction may have been during the 1582 Ant Antonio Espejo edition, expedition. Uh, Baltasar Obregón said they wrote, they have no chili, but the natives were given some to plant. But we do know that by 1601, chilies were not on the official list of Native American crops uh, that were being recorded by the Spanish. So we do know that uh, the acequia system that was put into place and maintained by Spanish colonists and Native Americans in the late 16th century really allowed chili peppers to spread in northern New Mexico. Chili peppers are a crop that do require supplemental irrigation here in this part of the world. So actually having this ready source of uh, irrigation to the agricultural fields allowed for increased crop production, including chili. And we know that these acequias uh, continue to serve farms around the state today. Now, the chilies in, in northern New Mexico, uh, we have some very, very distinct varieties compared to the varieties known as hatch or New Mexico type chilies. So oftentimes you'll see these called native chili. So it'll either be a land race chili or native. And these varieties are actually genetically distinct from the crops that are predominant, predominantly grown in southern New Mexico. Now, New Mexico land race chilies have a huge follow, following. Uh, they're celebrated for excellent flavor. Uh, they tend to be shorter fruit, they tend to be thin walled, and usually they're medium to very hot and pungency level. And one thing quite amazing about these New Mexico land race chilies is they're very, very early maturing. So with a relatively short growing season in northern New Mexico, they have time to quickly pop out of the ground, put on their fruit, and turn red. So there's plenty of time to get the full season in before the freeze comes. And these land race chilies also really contribute to the cultural identity of many of the northern New Mexico pueblos and communities that have their own unique uh, variety of peppers that they grow. A famous one that many people have heard of is the Chimayo chili, and that is historically grown in Chimayo, New Mexico, although there isn't one Chimayo chili. There's several different families that maintain their own, own type of uh, Chimayo chili. Now, what a land race is, if you question that, this is a, a variety of crop, uh, in my case, vegetables, but this could be other, other types of plants or animals. And uh, this, these chilies have been adapted to a localized environment for more than 100 years. And as I mentioned, these chilies have been grown in New Mexico for more than 400 years. So they've had a very, very long time to become uh, adapted to New Mexico growing conditions. 
Uh, different families around the state collected and stored their own seed over many generations. And just through this uh, saving seed from the best but most productive plants year after year, this is a very basic type of breeding where you're saving seed, number one, from those that had matured into uh, red, you see a mature seed in them. And of course, only plants that uh, they were able to withstand any diseases or pests or other local environmental conditions actually survived to give seed. So in this way, over many, many generations, you really develop some very uh, strong germplasm for your particular growing conditions. Now we have looked at New Mexico land race chilies because they're fascinating, but something we did find that's a bit sad is that many of the land races are very genetically mixed. You know, over the years, farmers didn't know that uh, chili peppers will easily cross pollinate. So if you don't take protective steps to make sure the uh, seed stays pure, and so when you were only growing the land race chili in your village or your community, that's not a problem. But when bell peppers, jalapenos, and other types were introduced, then we did get some genetic mixing of these uh, different types. Now that takes me to our chili that we know as hatch chili or the, or the our, uh, preferably called a New Mexico type chili. And uh, these chilies also have very uh, deep historic roots, not quite as long as the land race chilies. Uh, but the New Mexico type chili actually originated uh, through the work of Fabian Garcia. Now, Fabian Garcia was an amazing man who introduced many crops into New Mexico, including uh, different types of onions and pecan trees. Uh, he was in the very first graduating class of the New Mexico School of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts, that's now New Mexico State University. And he realized that he saw these land-raised chilies that were a bit diverse. And he realized that if he could breed something that was more standardized, perhaps a little bit more mild, it would appeal to a wider group of consumers. And it would also allow you to actually process the chili. So as processors need to know what they're getting in for efficient, uh, efficient canning. So through his work, uh, he developed the very first New Mexico pod type chili. Uh, which was named New Mexico Number no. 9. The official release was in 1913, although he had been working with it in this in the late 1980s. So the land race, uh, so, so I do want to point out a couple quick things. So uh, many people, and it drives me crazy, so this is definitely my bias, but uh, New Mexico type is very often referred to as Anaheim type. Now, that is, that is incorrect, and I always tell everyone, and please, I encourage the listeners here, if you hear anyone calling New Mexico type chili Anaheim, you should correct them and say, no, Anaheim chili needs to be called New Mexico type, because the Anaheim chili actually came about when Fabian Garcia was doing his breeding work, and he was visited by a gentleman named Emilio Ortega. Now, Emilio Ortega uh, actually was from Anaheim, but he visited Fabian Garcia and was fascinated with the work he was doing. And as many breeders do, Fabian Garcia shared some of his seed with Emilio Ortega, who took it back to Anaheim, California, and began his own variety of development work where he developed the Anaheim type and also founded the Ortega Chili Company. So, so it's incorrect. I always say Anaheim really has its, its origins here with New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico type chili is also often called hatch chili, but keep in mind there is no hatch chili variety. When you say hatch chili, what you're referring to is a New Mexico pod type chili that's grown in the hatch area. But really the hatch, uh, hatch name has really stuck in, into people's imaginations. So throughout the country, throughout the world, uh, we'll often incorrectly refer to it as hatch chili as well. So chilies do have deep uh, historic uh, roots in other ways. We have the very first scientifically based research article that was published by Fabian Garcia, Demand for Chili on the Increase back in 1929. It hasn't slowed down since then, it's still increasing. We also have a, a very nasty disease here that uh, continues to really hurt a lot of the uh, producers here in the state, a uh, chili wilt. Uh, it's caused by a soil-borne uh, water mold fungal-type pathogen, Phytophthora capsici. 
Uh, this pathogen is found throughout the world, but it was first discovered and reported, and we have the most virulent strains of Phytophthora capsici right here in New Mexico. So in 1922, we uh, hit the chilly uh, history books again by having uh, this disease described in the New Mexico field. And in fact, uh, some people may even find chili wilt beautiful. There's actually a fresco that's growing here in Foster Hall, our biology building here in the New Mexico State University campus that is called uh, the chili wilt. And it just shows a couple of farmers very unhappy that their chili plants are dying. Now, as with the acequias in northern New Mexico, here in southern New Mexico, we also needed a reliable source of irrigation to successfully grow and expand our, our pr agricultural production. So when Elephant Butte Dam was completed in 1916, it stopped the uh, flooding and the uh, uncertain production problems that growers south of uh, Hot Springs uh, experienced before then. So of course, Hot Springs is now truth or consequences. And of course, the Elephant Butte continues to uh, supply a lot of irrigation water for farmers uh, more southern in southern parts of the state. Of course, after completion, farming in the Hatch Valley and other areas along the Rio Grande Corridor just boomed. And of course, one of these communities that really boomed was Hatch, which is where we get our Hatch chili fame. So at this time, we had many growers that are growing different crops, but uh, Joseph Franzo is really credited with being the father of commercial scale Hatch chili. He had began farming in, in the Hatch Valley in 1918. And uh, at first he didn't take to chili, he ate it and thought he had been poisoned, but he quickly got over it. He realized that chili grew very well. And uh, he also started working with Fabian Garcia in the variety development. So between the two of them, with the university and with the commercial growers working together, they really created magic. And it really formed the basis for the fame of uh, Hatch Chili. Uh, the fame continues now with our Hatch Chili Festival that was first held in 1971. And it's been held every year since then, except for Labor Day weekend in 2020 during the pandemic. So people come throughout the world to visit the, uh, the famous Hatch Chili Festival. Now, in, in uh, addition to having the farmers growing the crop, of course, we were not able to use it all in a fresh way uh, back in the day. So we did have early cannery operations coming in uh, that were spurred on by the development and the release of Fabian Garcia's New Mexico Number no. 9 chili variety. Uh, this increased uh, the ability of processors to process the crop, to can the crop, and also allowed for distant shipping so that uh, consumers throughout the country and worldwide could start uh, tasting New Mexico chili. In fact, some of the first were Valley Canning and Mountain Pass Canning that in 1917 introduced the old El Paso brand. Now, some, uh, some notable folks in the history of uh, the chili industry here, in addition to Fabian Garcia, I'll mention Roy Nakayama. Uh, he was a breeder here at New Mexico State University uh, from 1950 to 1984. Uh, he also worked with local growers on their needs and uh, developed additional varieties that were consistent in shape and heat by uh, cross-pollinating some of our New Mexico types with some of the disease resistance and other valuable genetics from some of the wild types and other varieties from around the world. In particular, he worked with the Lytle family in developing Big Jim. So Big Jim was the farmer he was working with. Uh, Roy Nakayama also released the Espanol Improved and Arnaki. So I'll mention Big Jim first. So at the time, a New Mexico 6-4 was the main variety being grown. But after years of uh, seed saving without necessarily using proper isolation, the genetics was very variable. So Jim and June Lytle, uh, you know, approached Roy Nakayama. They started working together to select for larger, consistent fruit. And this came up, uh, ended up with the release of Big Jim, which still holds the world records for, uh, for largest chili pepper fruit size. And I will say June Lytle is uh, still working in the chili industry. She just had her 98th birthday a few weeks ago. Espanol Improve was another release by Roy Nakayama. It was released by him in 1984. And this was actually a variety that originated from a cross of Sandia, 
which is a popular hot New Mexico type chili and with one of those land races that I mentioned. So he was trying to get that early maturity into a New, Mex New Mexico pod type. And he did very, very well with Espanola Improved. So we know it has early maturity. It has great yield and uniformity. And it also recently rose to fame when it was uh, grown on the International Space Station and allowed uh, the astronauts up there to enjoy fresh chili with their meal. Uh, Paul Bosman is another notable um, chili breeder from New Mexico State University. Uh, he was here until 2018. He recently retired and is recognized around the world. Uh, he also founded the Chili Pepper Institute, where the seed of many of these varieties I'm mentioning, as well as many other varieties, uh, can be found at the cpi.org website. Uh, Paul Bosman also released other new popular New Mexico type cultivars, including New Mex Joe Parker and Sandia Select. Now, New Mexico type chili, let's talk about some of its characteristics. So we know that it's valued for its flavor. You know, most of us that really enjoy, if you live in New Mexico, and I'm not saying everybody does, but I think most of us really love the way it tastes. We also value it for its heat. Uh, the heat in chili peppers is important, imparted by capsaicin chemicals and also the pigments, the beautiful, bright, uh, deep red that we get from the ripe chili. And these come from a couple pigments uh, known as called capsanthin and capsarubin. So first heat, so capsaicin and other closely related chemicals, there's six naturally occurring. Uh, these are alkaline oily chemicals that we only find in, in fruit from the capsicum genus. So nowhere else in nature do you find a caps, capsaicin being naturally created. Now, many people incorrectly think that the seeds are the hottest part of chili peppers, but actually it's the vesicles. So if you see the picture here, uh, you see that bright yellow vein. Uh, that's where the capsaicin chemicals are actually being produced. So if you cut a chili pepper open and you see that bright yellow vein, that indicates that that's a very hot chili pepper. I'm often asked, can you tell how hot a chili pepper is just by looking at it? And I will say that uh, chili pepper breeders have mixed up the genetics enough that no, it doesn't matter the size. It doesn't matter how pointy the tip is. The way you can tell is by opening up to see those vesicles. Now, if you want to just get a taste of the, the chili to get the flavor without getting the heat, uh, just bite off the tip of an undamaged fruit below where the vesicles uh, extend, and you'll just get the flavor and not the heat. Then you give the next bite to your friend, and then they can tell you how hot it actually is. Bit of a dirty trick, but uh, very effective. Now, chili heat is reported in Scoville heat units, uh, so CHU. So one part per million equals 15 Scoville heat units. And this was actually based on a serial dilution and human panel tasting system that Wilbur Scoville, a pharmacist, uh, established back in the early 1900s to just compare different heat levels of different types of chili. Now, if you grow your own chili peppers, uh, it is tr very true that capsaicin production increases in fruit of stressed plants. So if you have a stressful year, the plants tend to put more energy into producing capsaicin and other flavor compounds in the fruit. So I will say we had a real stressful year we just got through. It was very, very hot while these fruit were maturing on the plants. So I will say, although it's really stressed out the plants, it's also going to make for very, very hot, flavorful chili. So this was a really, really good year to put up your, uh, your chili crop. Within ca the capsaicin chemicals, as I said, there's six naturally occurring and different types of chili peppers are going to have different levels of these different capsaicin compounds. And based on the, the relative uh, amount of each, it really does affect the flavor and the mouthfeel when you eat a chili pepper. So with most New Mexico type chilies, capsaicin is the uh, most abundant capsaicin compound. And we usually have about half the dihydrocapsaicin. And that gives us that very um, distinctive New Mexico type, that rapid, rapid heat that you get near the back of your throat. But other types of peppers, especially some of the habaneros and other types, uh, may have more homocapsaicin with a lo longer low intensity heat. 
or a nordohydrocapsis, which is actually a very mellow warming effect, you know, quite pleasant. So if you like the just the feel of different chili peppers, likely it's because of the complement of capsaicins, the different types of capsaicins in that particular type of pepper. So chili pigment, uh, this is also a very important quality of New Mexico chili. So, so of course, not all chili peppers mature to red, but most of the New Mexico type chilies will go from green to red. And the red chili color we see comes from two pigments that are very, very unique in nature, uh, rarely seen anywhere else. And that's capsanthin, which is a bright brick red pigment, and capsarubin, which is a deep brownish red pigment. And we actually have an industry here in New Mexico where these red pigments are extracted from paprikas and paprikas are New Mexico type, uh, highly pigmented, low heat uh, varieties. Uh, this this uh, oleoresin paprika is then used as a natural red food coloring. So if you see uh, natural red food coloring on your, your food package, very likely that comes from paprika that was grown in New Mexico. So as I mentioned, red or green, it's our state question. And uh, it still does amaze me to you know, many people who are not familiar with uh, growing chili out in the field, uh, don't realize that you know green and red fruit come on the same plant. But, but of course it's true, you know, the green fruit are just a, a immature fruit. The seed in green fruit is not viable yet. You can't typically grow new plants from seed that comes out of green fruit. You have to wait till it matures to the physiologically mature red stage. And uh, prior to about the mid 1980s, most New Mexico type chili varieties were developed to be dual purpose. So growers would plant their chili, they would harvest all the green, and then anything that was left on the plants they would allow to go to red for a red harvest later. So, so that worked great, you know, back when farmers were trying to get their green and red pack, you know, from the same fields. Mm -hmm. But once the industry matured, we, uh, we found that we had companies that would either pack green chili or red chili. And if you do this, you know, if you have a green chili, you really want a very thick, meaty, meaty fruit, and that does not dry down well for red harvest. If you're putting up red chili, you want something that's very thin wall that's gonna dry very, very efficiently. And, and that type, that is not gonna work if you take a green variety and vi vice versa. So basically the New Mexico chili industry split into a green industry and a red industry. And new chili varieties were bred for either superior green or superior red applications. Now here in New Mexico, this is a, a bit of an old pie chart, but it really still shows about the, uh, the split of, of our chili pepper production in the state. We have a little bit more than half of our acreage is in red chili or paprika, which as I mentioned, paprika is just a type of red chili uh, that was bred for very high pigments and very low pungency. Uh, that a little bit less is in the green. Uh, the fresh green market has increased quite a bit as more people throughout the country discover fresh roasted chili. But we still have uh, some of the largest green chili processes in the world here in the state. We also have a smaller uh, cayenne, uh, cayenne industry where this actually goes into uh, Louisiana hot sauce and other hot fermented sauce or sauce that spices your, your uh, chicken wings. Let's talk about the red chili and the green chili industries, though, specifically. Uh, the red chili and paprika, with these crops, the vast majority of this material is dried down after it's harvested. Uh, the largest, larger processors in the state you know, grow their own varieties that they specifically developed for the pigments, for the heat level that they prefer. And in these types of varieties, uh, the extractable pigment, so the, the amount of capsanthin, capsarubin, and other pigments in there, as well as thin wall for easy drying and very, very low heat levels are valued because most of the red chili and paprika is going in for some flavor, but more for coloring. And uh, we do have New Mex Garnet. Uh, this was a red chili that was released by New Mexico State University about, I think it's been about 20 years now. Uh, most of our red chili and paprika for commercial production is currently mechanically harvested. Uh, since we're drying down this crop anyway, it can take a little bit of a beating. So, so the industry transitioned to mechanical harvest about 10, 20 years ago. 
Uh, the machines with the inclined double helix picking heads, like that pictured here on the bottom, are those that are most commonly used to pick the red chili crop. So de to dehydrate our red chili crop, we know historically here in New Mexico, as well as currently through most of the world, really the most uh, e efficient, cheapest way to dry your red chili is by laying it on ditch banks, on tarps, on roofs. Uh, you can also hang it in ristras. And this works great if you're only trying to dry a very, very small amount of chili. But of course, as processors are trying to, we're trying to increase their throughput, uh, and also when you start worry about worrying about birds, other phytosanitary uh, issues, uh, the industry very quickly adopted commercial dryers. We have tunnel dryers and continuous belt dryers so they're, they're, we keeps the crop clean and we can dry down the red chili very, very quickly this way. It doesn't look quite as pretty as hanging in ristros, but uh, it's an efficient way for the processors. So for popular red chili cultivars of the New Mex types, well, New Mexico 6.4 is a, is a beautiful, very mild variety. It's not the highest yielding, but it does very well even in years when uh, conditions are hard. It's kind of the, uh, the workhorse of chilies and still a very, very popular variety. A uh, sandia is a popular hot variety, and both New Mexico New Mex 64, New Mexico 64, and sandia are great chilies to put in ristras because they dry down beautifully. The, the fruit won't rot when you hang them up. Uh, Espanola improved also dries pretty well. Uh, LB25 is a popular paprika type, and I just mentioned New Mex garnet. That's a paprika that was released by New Mexico State University. And if you see the asterisk, asterisk there, that's dual purpose. So you can really get a very good green chili out of it, and they also dry down very well for red use. So what to do with red chili? Well, you know, make a red chili sauce. Once you have a delicious red chili sauce pre prepared, you can use it for many different things. Uh, usually red chili sauce has the dried New Mexico chili, uh, onions, garlic, salt, uh, other seasoning. And of course, once you have this sauce, you can use it for enchiladas, you can put it in burritos, uh, mix it with beans for spicy beans, potatoes, eggs. Uh, many, many things that you can do with uh, with red chili sauce. And we do have many products that are packaged by very large processors and some family-owned operations here uh, that use and uh, sell red chili. And the traditional way, of course, is to take the dried red fruit and then, then rehydrate them and then uh, put them in your food processor to make red sauce. So how about the green chili industry in New Mexico? So with our green chili fruit, uh, these are harvested when they're full size. So they're about as big as they're, they're, as big as they're gonna get, uh, but they haven't turned red yet. So they're still immature fruits. So we call them, they're horticulturally mature, but they're physiologically immature. Uh, with our green chili, of course, we, we value very large fruit, a thick wall to get the most bang from the buck from every fruit. And we do have a large processed green chili industry here, and they typically use very, very large steam peelers uh, that they'll quickly get that crop from the field before it deteriorates because, of course, green chili is more perishable than red chili. Uh, that's very quickly frozen or canned, hold or sliced, and then it's often used in salsas and other types of finished products at the processing plants. So green chili here in New Mexico, because it is so uh, delicate, highly perishable, it continues to be mostly hand harvested. Now, some uh, New Mexico green chili varieties, uh, they're delicious, very popular, include New Mex Joe Parker, a New Mex Big Jim, which we mentioned. A New Mex Sandia Select was a release from Paul Boslin that was an improvement on, New Me on, on Sandia uh, to get thicker fruit wall, uh, more uniform fruits. It's become a very, very popular hot green chili type. Uh, AZ 1904 was released by one of our uh, collaborators over in Arizona, hence the AZ, and it's a very productive green chili type. So how do we prepare New Mexico type green chili. Well, because of the very uh, thick cuticle that covers those fruit, uh, we need to roast them first. So we need to get that cuticle off. Uh, you can do this, so, so the large processors use steam peelers, but at home you can use the oven, a roaster, a gas stove, 
or an outdoor grill, especially get a couple cold beers out there with friends and roast chili. It makes for a wonderful evening. Uh, we also have the rotary roasters that are very popular. We'll see them throughout New Mexico during a uh, green chili season. We basically, these uh, you have the flames coming out, you put your bag of green chili in there and then turn it. In all cases, no matter how you're roasting them, you wanna look for that nice black blistered skin on all sides of that chili. And that means that the skin has separated. Then with gloves, especially if you're using very hot chili, I promise you, you'll regret it if you peel the chilies with your bare hands. <laughs> so, so use some heavy rubber gloves, peel that cuticle off, and then the green chili is ready to use. So in the oven, roast about 20 minutes at 450. Of course, turn the fruit over to blister all sides. Uh, same with the gas stove, make sure it's blistered and keep, keep them turned. Uh, and same with the gas or charcoal grill, just to make sure they're thoroughly seared on all sides before you peel them with gloves and then use them in your favorite recipes. So what to do with green chilies? Well, uh, many types, we can certainly make green chili sauce with them, you know, roasted green chilies, once again, with onions, garlic, a chicken or beef stock or salt, a wide variety of different types of recipes. I know my brother used to use, like, like to use uh, cream of mushroom soup <laughs> with, uh, with more, a lot more chili than cream of mushroom soup. They actually came out pretty good. Uh, how about uh, putting in eggs? Green chili cheeseburgers, they're famous. New Mexico has become quite famous for our green chili cheeseburgers. Uh, burritos, green chili stew is one of my favorites. Just put that green chili in there with your other, with your, your meat, your potatoes, your other vegetables. Uh, mix it with beans. And of course, the enchiladas are one of our, our iconic dishes here in New Mexico. And, and because it's so good, I have a slide just for our, our chili rellenos. So many people love these. It's a New Mexico staple. Uh, the recipes do vary, but typically this is going to be a, a peeled green chili that's stuffed with cheese, then battered on the outside, and then deep fried. And yeah, chili rellenos are absolutely delicious. So we do have many processors here, large, medium, and small size in the state uh, that package green chili into different products. So you can just buy frozen green chili straight. Uh, we do have dried green chili powder. It does take more energy to dry the green chili fruit, but uh, because there's a demand for the powder, uh, we do have processors that do that. Uh, many, many types of green chili salsa is available for sale. And uh, it also goes into a wide variety of other products like green chili wine, uh, candy, like our green chili peanut brittle. So I'm going to get now into some of the more of the challenges that we've had with the New Mexico chili industry uh, in, in more recent years or kind of recent and then very recent. Uh, first of all, for those of you who have lived in New Mexico for some time, you may have remembered the chili boom that this state had in the late 1980s that ended about uh, the early 1990s where we had just an amazing amount of acreage here in the state. So we were topping out, we had almost 36,000 acres of chili being grown in the state. Uh, processing plants were expanding their capacity like crazy. It was just wild. I mean, growers were growing chili after chili in fields, which is a really bad crop rotation practice, but it was so profitable at that time that growers were trying to crank out as much chili as they could. So in recent years, uh, the production has really stabilized to about 8,000 to 9,000 acres. So it ha hasn't gone down quite a bit in recent years. This was really, um, you know, many, many worldwide factors contributed to this change. First of all, at the acreage we're going back then, I don't think we could have really maintained it because we just don't have that much farmland here in New Mexico, especially if you're practicing good crop rotation. But uh, back then, we had the North American Free Trade Agreement come in, or NAFTA as we know it, and they, that eliminated tariffs on imported chili peppers in 1994. So this really opened up the market, and chili is a very labor-intensive crop, especially green chili now because it's completely hand-harvested. And just the harvest costs are at about 50% of the input costs for the production of that whole crop. Now, if we're competing with crops, uh, sorry, competing with producing countries like Mexico, they have very, very low wages compared to what we have here in the United States. 
And so it really put our growers at a disadvantage in producing chili. So we really had to start fighting uh, imports, taking over all our acreage here in the state. There's a few ways we worked on doing this. Uh, before that, we, we first kind of saw our labor issues coming to a head, though, way back around after World War II. Uh, you know, during World War II, we, we lost a lot of people here in the country who went off to war. So we had a lot fewer human hands out there to actually pick crops out in the fields. So the Bracero program was introduced at this time to bring in guest workers to fill this labor demand and, and take, uh, take the place of all the young men who went off, young men and women who went off to fight during World War II. So this was originally going to end in 1947. And so this just put a panic through growers because they just didn't think they were gonna get enough people back to pick their crops out of the field, which is a huge, huge problem if you're a farmer. You put all your effort, all your money into producing this crop, you need to get out of the field to the market. So there was a strong demand for mechanization, mechanization research in the 1950s and 1960s when farmers knew that the Bracero program was going to soon end. So we did, uh, this did hit a big snag though, because uh, uh, in 1978, there was a lawsuit against the University of California because they were working on mechanical lettuce harvesters. And basically the United States Department of Agriculture said, okay, we can no, have, no longer have public funding on any research that is going to potentially put people out of work. So Chile mechanization research here at New Mexico State, it stopped. And actually at that time, our agricultural engineering program was disbanded. So we had a double whammy here at New Mexico State. Uh, a few growers and private equipment manufacturers did continue this, uh, this effort that they felt was very important to the long-term uh, viability of the industry. Uh, in 1965, uh, Ernest Riggs, who ran one of the red chili processing plants here in Southern New Mexico, was recorded having the first mechanical harvest of chili by, by a machine there, well, I guess mechanical harvest of chili. And he just basically took a cotton picker uh, out to the field to see what it would do. And it kind of shredded things. But it was a start. Uh, this gentleman here in the picture on the left is Wandel Krieger, and he actually got the first patent of a helix picking head for Chile in 1971. I had the great pleasure of meeting him there a few years back. So after NAFTA came in, the industry was in a panic and growers were in a panic. So they actually came to New Mexico State University and said, hey, we need help or we are gonna lose the chili pepper industry in New Mexico. So the Chile Task Force was formed. Uh, this was a collaboration with engineers, uh, crop physiologists, breeders, uh, growers, and industry to see if we could uh, advance mechanization again. And with red chili, we succeeded. As I mentioned, about 20 years, red chili was really a transition to mechanization, but green chili still had a lot of challenges. You know, green chili fruit are not uniform. They don't roll very well. It's hard to orient them on a belt for processing. Uh, if the fruit are broken by the mechanical harvest picking mechanism, it really reduces their, um, their quality and their uh, acceptability for the processing plants, not, not to mention home consumers. And destemming or removing of that stem and calyx is very important for processing, but it's really hard to do mechanically. So when you have hand harvesters out in the field currently, they will pop that green chili off of the plant and then pop that pedestal off at the same time. So if we mechanically harvest green chili, we need to have some way to mechanically remove that woody material uh, from the product flow so that we don't all end up with woody stems and our salsa that we uh, bite into very unpleasantly. So I'm very, very pleased to say that we've made a great advance towards uh, mechanizing green chili. Uh, in 2020, we released New Mex Odyssey. Uh, this New Mexico type green chili was specifically developed for mechanical harvest efficiency. And it does give us a very high yield of undamaged fruit uh, because we, we selected for traits like higher fruit set so that the pickers didn't like run over and crunch the fruit. A strong single stems as pictured there in the middle of picture and the fruit come off of the plant are relatively easy. And I'm really, really proud and pleased to say that here in this year, 2023, we had our very first year of commercially processed mechanically harvested New Mexico green chili. It was New Mexico Odyssey from a company in Hatch and it did go through commercial processing. So we, we hit a great milestone this year.
Of course, we're not stopping there. Uh, there's a lot more uh, exciting research to look into. Uh, we are currently working with uh, robotics engineers, uh, both in field sensing so that we can, we can get these uh, field-based robots out there to uh, sense plant stress. Do these plants need fertilizer? Uh, do they need to be irrigated? Are there pests or diseases? Uh, these robots will quickly pick up on any plant stresses so that uh, the grower can react to this and uh, get those plants on the happy track again. And this is, uh, we're a long ways from getting there, <laughs> but uh, we do have students here uh, working on fruit harvesting with robots. So like I said, we're certainly a very, very long way from successfully accomplishing this, but it's been, been really fun to explore it to see if we can get robots to uh, not only pick, but see a green chili fruit when they're completely covered in green leaves. Very challenging. We also have some other research in agrivoltaics. So for those of you who aren't familiar with agrivoltaics, this is when you put uh, solar panel shading above crop or livestock production. So, you know, when you have wild chiltopenes, we talked about the wild, wild type chiltopenes, you know, often we'll find them growing in the wild sheltered under a rock or another shrub. And we do have very intense sunlight. We have very stressful conditions here. So we wanted to see if partial shading of chili pepper plants can perhaps enhance growth by, by reducing some of the stresses on those plants during the hottest parts of the year. Now, we do know that there's many advantages to shading crops like chili. They're being grown here during the summer in southern New Mexico. We know that, uh, that we can reduce some of the damaging red radiation that will reach our plants. You know, we can often see fruit sunburn or other issues. We know that partial shading reduces moisture loss in the soil. So we're not just baking, completely baking the soil. We can release the heat stress on the plants during the hottest part of the day where we can increase the humidity around the plants, which is a more healthful growing environment. And we can cool the area around the plants by a few degrees, which may be just what it takes to really uh, keep our chili plants very happy. Now we have uh, it also in order to uh, just help the New Mexico chili industry. Uh, back in 2012, the New Mexico Chili Association team with the New Mexico Department of Agriculture to establish the New Mexico Chili Labeling Law. Now this is a law, they're still working out the bugs in this, but essentially uh, this is to help uh, consumers recognize that chili peppers that are grown in New Mexico are a very special commodity. And we do know that if we take some of our seed of New Mexico types, grow in other states or other areas, you don't necessarily get the same flavor and quality as when you grow them here in New Mexico. So for chili that's, that's sold here in New Mexico, if it's declared that it's New Mexico chili, the the uh, the seller must prove and have documentation that that chili was actually grown here in New Mexico, and this uh, this program is administered by uh, by the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. So future challenges for New Mexico chili, well, so climate change, we know that that's going to continue to create production challenges throughout the world. You know, not just in our chili crop but uh, crops that are growing and dependent on certain heat units, certain temperatures, uh, certain periods of growth, it's all being thrown into a bit of a disarray now. We don't really know exactly how things are gonna end up landing here, but we do know here in this part of the country, uh, predictions are that we are gonna have uh, less av available irrigation. Our water sources are going to be less and not as predictable. We know we're gonna get more erratic weather, uh, so strange early, late freezes, uh, hail events, uh, very strong rain or very long periods of drought, uh, increased seasonal heat, like what we saw this past year when we, we went through some very, very hot conditions, particularly here in Southern New Mexico. And we do know because we have a longer growing season, we're gonna have increased pest and disease pressure. So we're not gonna get the real cold temperatures that kill some of our insect pests. And we're also gonna have a longer growing period for those weeds to grow and put out more seed. So that's gonna be some additional challenges. 
Uh, we also know that New Mexico is not the only place that loves chili. <laughs> you know, we, we know that the, we're the chili center of the universe. But if you talk to people in South Korea and China and Africa, they think they're the chili pepper center of the world. So uh, we know international com competition will continue to grow. So we need to continue to support our growers here through research and continue to really tout the excellent quality uh, that we produce our New Mexico chili. And please, please remember to tell everyone it's New Mexico chili, it's not Hatch chili, and it's certainly not Anaheim chili. So for New Mexico, I really think our chili crop uh, future is bright. You know, New Mexico chili, it's a unique crop that we grow here. We have amazing uh, pro progressive farming families that uh, the chili's been in their, their family for generations here. And we do know that the demand for chili grown here in New Mexico is strong. We really can't produce enough to meet the demand. Uh, we also have a lot of initiatives in to support our growers and support production, uh, including our Healthy Soul initiatives that are spearheaded by the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. We know growers are really looking at putting in robust crop rotation, you know, not chili after chili, so that we can really regenerate the soil as opposed to uh, as opposed to using it, using it up. We want to build it for the long term instead, and we are. Uh, most of the fields that grow New Mexico chili have transitioned to drip irrigation, which is the most efficient way of applying irrigation water to the crop. And mechanical harvest has start, started. So we, we've, we've started to begin to even the playing field with competing countries that have very, very labor, low labor costs and high labor availability to what we have here in the United States. And keep in mind, New Mexico chili, it, it's celebrated for its terroir, its flavor and quality. And this comes from both the genetics that went into it as well as where it's being grown. And we can really be proud of our chili here in the same way wine growers you know, say that their particular wine you know, has its own special qualities, we can absolutely say the same thing about our chili crop. And I think with that, I thank you all for your attention tonight and I'll be happy to take any questions. And this is my contact information if you'd like to reach out to me. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Chili Pepper Institute does sell seed for these varieties, as well as uh, many other uh, items of uh, chili merchandise. So it's a great place to come shopping for your, your Christmas gifts. And uh, we do have an online store if you can't make it down uh, to our store here in Las Cruces that's currently in Gerald Thomas Hall on the main New Mexico State University campus. Thank you so much. Um... Dr. Stephanie Walker, um, so appreciate you. Um, and we have a lot of folks in the chat saying thank you and wonderful presentation. Uh, we did have a question here. Will this presentation or PowerPoint slides be available on the New Mexico State University website? Um, yes, yes, I can. We, we can do that. And I believe the library is also recording it, correct? We are, uh, I don't think, I don't know if we got official um, okay from you to have it on our YouTube channel. But... Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And I will uh, make it a point to uh, post it to the Chili Pepper Institute site. Then yes, we'll have it on our Santa Fe Public Library YouTube channel um, shortly hereafter. And if there's any other questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand to be unmuted. Um, uh, you can write it in the chat box or Q and A. And Aaron, let me know if there's any any um, questions from the in person audience. Question. question. Yes, we have a question here. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. What percentage of a state's economy is built around uh, chili peppers? Oh, that's yeah, that's a, what uh, so that's a good question. You know, I will say that there's other crops here in the state that contribute more to the economy, like our, our livestock, our dairy industry, our pecans, uh, oil and gas. <laughs> so I, I don't know for sure. So, you know, relative to those industries, it's going to be smaller, but I'd say wild guess, maybe 5%. And I definitely would need to run that by an economist, though, to know for sure. I have a question as well. Uh, do we have another question here? Yeah. Um, uh, 
Dr. Walker, you mentioned um, early on one of the slides you had um, uh, referred to a lawsuit against the University of California system um, to stop them from using federal funds. Yes, that's to automate, automate crops, crop uh, harvesting. Was yes. that simply was that was that a, a was that a all crops in the United States that the federal government didn't want mechanization? Yes. For? What happened to that? Yes, that's my understanding. Yes. But it's no longer true. It, yes, that's, not... that's correct. I, I think finally the uh, the USDA came to their senses and realized that we were really shooting ourselves in the foot to stop any any uh, research along that uh, along those lines. Yes, yeah, if I may, you know, great well meaning um, well meaning steps by them, but it's amazing how humans often do that. You know, they do something that seems good at the time that really has long-term uh, adverse consequences. And certainly that uh, that edict by the USDA did that. And I'm still, uh, it's still, like, I'm sorry. A lot of government edicts are like that. Yes, <laughs> yes, so, so true. So yeah, I'm glad they're not doing anymore. And for me, you know, when I came to the university and was studying as a graduate student, I mean, it was really hard on me because I didn't have any agricultural engineers to work with. And so uh, we actually had to work with the cotton cotton ginning lab agricultural engineers. But fortunately, by that time, like I said, we'd come to our senses and realize, hey, we need to work on on this type of technology if we're going to uh, if we're going to continue to produce crops in the United States and, and feed ourselves. One last question. Yeah, we got one more question here. Uh, I was a little confused at the outset about this misnomer of the hash name. Uh huh. I not be telling people from around the world that these chilies that were created in southern New Mexico should not properly be called hatch chilies, despite them being in the vicinity of hatch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. Uh, you know, I I guess I please you know feel free to call them hatch chilies if that's what they're they want to hear. I uh, you know, right now we currently have a bit of a. Um, well, I guess I can go to there's actually a lawsuit right now, because if you go to the store, you may see a cans of chili that are labeled as Hatch Chili. Uh, that is not chili from Hatch. There's actually an out of state company that has the rights to that label. So we actually have some growers in Hatch that have had this very long, long term expensive lawsuit about the use of that Hatch label. Uh, in addition, here in southern New Mexico, we have a lot of New Mexico type chili that's grown in Luna County and Deming and Doña Ana County here in Las Cruces, that there's also a bit of a struggle. Can we call that hatch chili that's being grown in Las Cruces or Deming versus hatch? And I will say it's all, you know, similar growing conditions, same varieties, you know, great, great quality. Uh, but of course, some growers in hatch do not want to allow people in other growing areas to call it hatch. And so I, I think Hatch is, is too permanently fixed in the, um, the minds of people throughout the country and world to get away from the Hatch name. But really, like I said, just because of these issues with the Hatch labeling, with growing areas, just a little, little ways from Hatch, it's more correctly called New Mexico type chili. I'll just call it champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, yes. <laughs> and a great vintage here in 2023. <laughs> There was a question there in the chat about whether it's considered, uh, chilies are considered a fruit or a vegetable. Yeah, oh, another classic question. So are chilies a fruit or vegetable? So botanically speaking, they're a berry because they're, they're burying their seeds inside. So horticulturally speaking, it's a fruit. So you'll often hear me call them as fruit. But by the USDA definition about how, how most are eaten, how most people prepare them for uh, you know, in, in different recipes, they're usually prepared as a vegetable. And it's more, yeah, something about... Uh, that 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 causes the confusion, but you're you're correct in calling them fruits. Fruit. And there's another question in the chat, and I'm going to mispronounce this. I'm sure of it. Um, how did the seeds of capsic capsaicin travel from South America to North America? Okay. Yeah, they came up by by people. Yeah, the seed, like I said, once the fruit were uh, through selective breeding by humans, we got those big big fruits fruit uh, 
fruit that could no longer be uh, moved by birds, humans took over. So humans started trading seeds, you know, around different uh, trading uh, trading routes. So birds got got the start, and then humans took over and spreading chili pepper seed. Any other okay. questions from our Southside Library attendees or anyone here in the webinar? Uh, Jennifer asked, are, um, are there global chili competitions as there are wanting competitions? Hmm. That's a, you know, that is an excellent idea. <laughs> so I, I'm sure that there are in different countries competitions like that. Just like we have the chili taste off here in New Mexico. I'm not that aware though country to country and it is interesting you, you can really see different countries have really developed the, the, the same way we've developed our new mexico type the flavors the qualities we love if you go to south korea you know they have a sweeter type chili that, that they really use and they you know don't don't like our chili as much as theirs if you go to south america you know they have different flavor profiles that they prefer so it would be really interesting. I don't know how you'd really judge that, but having a big competition amongst countries, uh, I think I think, think it's a great idea if you want to start organizing it. I'll be happy to attend. <laughs> well, if there aren't any more questions, I just want to say thank you very much, Stephanie, for your presentation. It was very, very informative. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us a million times. Thank you, Stephanie Walk, for doing this program with us at the library and for our community. We so appreciate you and this wonderful presentation. And what's better than celebrating our chili peppers here in New Mexico? Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Aaron, over at Southside. Right, good night, everyone. Is she in this building? No, no. Oh, she's